Okay, so we get to close this great, uh, this great course. Um, and what I'm going to do is, um, first I want to thank the French residents for uh, showing us your wonderful faces. It takes a lot of guts to stand up in front of a group and, uh, and present. Uh, you all did a very wonderful job and uh, your cases were very nice, so congratulations to you. What I'm going to show you, um, for 22 years, I've been a uh, radiology consultant for the New York Wildlife Conservation Society. So that's the Bronx Zoo, the Prospect Park Zoo, the Central Park Zoo, and the New York Aquarium. And uh, so I'm going to show you some of the things that, uh, that uh, I, we've uh, done and uh, learned from the uh, wildlife. Okay. So... When um, the zoo, the Wildlife Conservation Society, has about 700,000 uh, animals of various sizes. And the, um, the animal experience is actually such where the, uh, the zoo is focused on conservation. And uh, all the activities that the zoo does are focused on uh, getting the animals to, to do well which means one of the markers of any zoo is the breeding program. So, uh, the uh, Bronx Zoo has a very large uh, western uh, lowland gorilla population. And uh, when, soon after I started working with the zoo, they, um, they raised this program because they were trying to breed the western lowland gorillas. But they had a problem because it's difficult to know when the gorilla is ovulating. The, um, you, you can't really see when the women have their periods. They don't, they don't bleed so much that you can see. You don't see anything. They don't behave any differently. Um, and so the zoo decided that they wanted to do ultrasound. So what they would do is they would uh, separate some of the women because if all of the women were kept together, all of the female gorillas, then they'd all ovulate at the same time. But the male isn't going through all the females at the same time when they're all ovulating. So they decided they're going to separate the females, find out when a certain female is ovulating, and then put her with the male. Um, just, uh, just when she's ovulating. So they decided they wanted to do ultrasound. So they spoke to me about the ultrasounds, and I said, you know, I'm a bone radiologist, but for you guys, I'll do anything. So they said, oh, okay. So they gave uh, the first, first gorilla, it was a female western lowland gorilla, big gorilla. So they gave her general anesthesia. I come in, they've already put her on the table, and she's in the lithotomy position, both feet are up. And I come in, I have the ultrasound machine already set up. And I'll tell you, I've done some examinations on all kinds of inner city Bronx women, but I was not ready for this experience. And so uh, that uh, took some getting used to. Um, you might not believe this, but these women don't wash regularly. So I insert the uh, probe, and as I'm inserting the probe, the veterinarian starts screaming, stop, stop. So I stop, and they said, wait. You can't go so deep. I said, I didn't go so deep. I'm only two centimeters. They said, the whole vagina is only four centimeters deep. I said, this is ridiculous. How could this be? She's a giant gorilla. They said, the gorillas have very, the western lowland gorillas have very shallow vaginas and ve a very small penis. I said, oh, I understand why this is an endangered species now. <laughs> so we did the, uh, the uh, we started doing the ultrasounds, and the, uh, the staging system worked. And if you visit the Bronx Zoo, you see the Bronx Zoo has one of the highest birth rates now in the, in, in the world, from, pop from uh, world zoos that have western lowland gorilla populations. In fact, we had so many... Uh, Western lowland gorillas that were born, that the zoo decided that the dominant male, the dominant male will not let any other male come near the females. This is, they're all his. So he takes his turn, but nobody else goes near the females. And they decided that this male had overrepresented himself in the captive Western lowland gorilla population, not just at the zoo, but the Bronx Zoo was having so many newborns that they said he's already having a significant impact on the world population of young gorillas. 
So they decided that he and five of his male sons would all be sent away to another zoo, Graceland, in Tennessee. Uh, that's the Elvis Presley uh, Zoo, where they, by agreement, they, are, they only have male gorillas. No females, and they do not engage in breeding. So only having males means they can engage in whatever they want, but they will not breed. So there came the interesting question, how do you send a gorilla from New York City to Tennessee, a distance of something like 2,000 kilometers? And the answer is Federal Express. <laughs> so what happened is this, they call me to the zoo, so every animal that comes in or goes out has to have a full medical exam, so each gorilla gets anesthetized, and then we do x-rays, ultrasound, blood work, and uh, all of this is happening. And then when they finish, they as soon as the gorilla is asleep, of course, they always do dental work. They do cleanings, they do the, and this is the same veterinarians, they do, uh, they fill the cavities. So people say, how do you, can you x-ray a gorilla? I say, how does this veterinarian do a root canal on a uh, walrus? So it's, uh, you know, you do what you have to do with uh, various animals. So each animal that finished, there was a cage ready. They put some hay, they put the animal in the cage. And then they, the animal wakes up and it's in its cage, all five. At the end, they put plywood with holes in it against the sides of the cages, put all five cages in a truck, took the truck to uh, JFK, put them all on an empty FedEx plane that was chartered, and then flew it to Tennessee. When the gorillas were taken off, the whole FedEx plane was washed down with 10% hypochlorite. 10% bleach, the entire plane, because the gorillas have multi's drug resistant diarrhea. <laughs> and then uh, the gorillas got uh, trucked. So that was an experience. Mm -hmm. So, one day I get called, we have a problem. We have a uh, one and a half year old who's got a swollen, some swollen joints. <coughs> so I run down to the zoo and, and sure enough, here's the wrist and it's very swollen wrist, right? I'm sorry, for the French, I should be putting these with the fingers facing down. <laughs> I learned that today. Okay, right. And the, uh, you see the ankles also, there's very extensive soft tissue swelling. The articulate, the joint spaces are well preserved, but with such soft tissue swelling in, uh, in, in disparate areas, ankle and wrist, the top of the list is juvenile chronic arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. That's top of the list. That's a very serious diagnosis because that means this child, this uh, gorilla goes on steroids and uh, the, uh, these are precious animals. The zoo would be afraid of, uh, of avascular necrosis. You know, we're not afraid in humans, but not in uh, animals. So I told him, I said, this, you know, this is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So they said, oh, so that's probably what his brother has too. I said, what do you mean his brother? Oh, his brother has the same thing. What's the difference in age between them? One year. When did they get the wrist pain? About a week apart. That doesn't sound like JRA. <laughs> I said, wait, wait, wait. Let's go back through the history. Because in humans, there is an entity. It's called post-infectious reactive arthropathy. And it is, it's reported to, it looks like JRA, and it follows diarrheal diseases of Shigella and uh, other type of uh, diarrheal diseases. Now, there's no way to prove it, but indeed, the, uh, we x-rayed the, the brother, and the x-rays look the same. So, um, so the vets presented this to the curator of mammals. The curator of, of primates is the one who makes the final decision on all risky treatments. So the decision here was, do we make a bet that it's post-reactive infectious arthropathy, do nothing and watch, and if so, it should go away within a year, never to return? Or do they treat with steroids now with fear that it is JRA? So the curator of mammals says, we're gonna wait and see. And sure, within six months, the animals were behaving totally normally. Within a year, they were, by physical exam, completely normal. Now, you could say, how do I know what normal is? Um, we made a policy at the zoo right after I started at the zoo 22 years ago, and that is that every time a rare or endangered animal 
or an animal that we don't have experience with is anesthetized for any reasons, we initially it was just x-ray. Now we do ultrasound and mammography on every animal. Now we don't do mammals for breast disease. We do mammals because it's low energy technique and it lets us look at bone detail. We use mammal for metabolic bone disease assessments. But um, uh, by the time these babies were born, I had already a repository of uh, radiographs on 20 gorilla extremities, 20 different animals. So I had a, nor a good normal base to compare to. I knew these were clearly abnormal. Now, this is another gorilla hand. This gorilla had another problem. This gorilla had a seizure. Now, um, this was actually the, the first animal I ever examined from the zoo. And I was, I, uh, in my last year of residency, I was chief resident. And I got a phone call. Oh, we're from the zoo and we're bringing a gorilla over. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds fine. Now, we used to do that to each other all the time. Call up and make up funny things. And then somebody would go set up for a penile angiogram. And then it was like, oh, that was a joke. But, um, so I'm sure this was a joke. And the guy says, you think this is a joke, but call the neuroradiologist. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> And then I called the radiologist and I said, oh, I'm sorry, Frank, to bother you. It's no guy. No, this was a joke. He says, yeah, about the gorilla, I'm on my way in. I said, it's real? He says, yeah, it's real. Set it up. So I hang up the phone. I say, wow, there is a God. Thank you. And then I go to the MR and I tell the text, oh, we're doing an MR of a gorilla. And they were like, how do you do an MR of a gorilla? I said, beats the hell out of me, but we're going to be doing one really soon. So the gorilla comes in. It's under general anesthesia. We put it inside, we do the MR, we give it gadolinium, it's got this thing in the frontal lobe. So then the, uh, the uh, neuroradiologist says, oh, we're going to take, we want to do a CT. Let's see if it's calcified. It might be a congenital infection in the frontal lobe. So let's do a CT. The MR then was in a trailer outside the hospital, so it was easy access. The CT was in the center of the hospital. So I tell him, I said, how are we going to bring this gorilla into the hospital? He said, we'll just put it on a gurney and uh, take it. So we put the, the boots that you use in the operating room, we put it on its hands and its feet. We put an OR hat on its head. We covered its face with a mask. We put a sheet over the whole gorilla. Somebody was standing and bagging because it was under general anesthesia. But the gorillas stink. Oh, boy, do they stink. So we're wheeling, we're wheeling this thing through the hospital. And I tell him, I said, he smells. Somebody's going to know. He says, no problem. We'll say it's just a transfer from the city hospital. <laughs> Nobody knew. We walk by two residents. They're discussing their admission from the ER. Nothing. The guy with the floor waxer, nothing. We go by a security guard, the head nurse's office, nothing. We scan him. He did have calcifications in the uh, brain. It was a congenital infection. And then I asked the neuroradiologist, how can we get him out of here? He said, nobody noticed the phone. We're just going to wheel him right out of the front door of the hospital. And that's what we did. We wheeled a gorilla out of the front door of the hospital, and nobody knew. Now I know how I can come to work. 30 computers are missing. And I said, where'd they all go? <laughs> somebody probably took him right out the front door. So this gorilla ended up going into status epilepticus. And so we took his, uh, uh, every animal that, di that uh, dies at the zoo, for whatever reason, gets an autopsy. So these are the hands of the gorilla. So he died at the end of age eight. And when you look at his hands, so you, you see over here the, the soft tissues, that's normal in a gorilla. They are very, very thick soft tissues. The bones themselves look okay. You look at the, it looks like an eight-year-old hand. So initially they mature faster than we do, but then they catch up. This is the other hand. And you can see the neurotrophic changes. There's overtubulation, there's osteopenia, there's enlargement at the ends of bone. These are classic neurotrophic changes. So he had these changes, but he's so big and he's so well compensated that the vets, by their exam, because they only could examine him under anesthesia, they never knew that he was partially, at least, hemiparetic. They couldn't tell. So this is the same gorilla. So it tells you we're dealing with animals that are, they don't communicate well. Now, this is a uh, radiograph, chest radiograph, of a six-month-old six uh, Western lowland gorilla. Uh, and it's normal. Uh, you know, we brought the, ch the uh, child in for an exam for whatever. And uh, so as part of this, 
the, we x-ray the animals. And it's, it is a radiation risk. On the other hand, it adds to our understanding of the range of normal. And uh, Zoo made a decision that it's, it's good for the animal itself to have a baseline and good for us to have baselines of the species. Now, I looked at this radiograph and I was astounded by how human it looks like. I mean, this looks like a, a two-year-old, three-year-old x-ray. So I took this x-ray and I, I took it to the hospital. <laughs> and what I did was I created a flashcard for it and I put it in the stack for the pediatric radiologist. <laughs> and I sat on the side and I didn't say a word. And I was watching what he'd say. And he was reading and as he was going along and he had some residents around him. And he threw this one up and he picked up his dictaphone and he goes, normal baby gorilla. And he takes it down. He knew. <laughs> he was so good. And the way he knew, I asked him. And the way he knew, it's not projecting here, they have large ears. And he saw the ears. And he knew, and he saw me sitting in the corner, and he smelled a rat, and I was the rat. Okay, so gelato baboons are another interesting type of animal, and uh, they're also quite dominant. And this is the spine of a gelato baboon that passed away at the zoo a few years ago at age 80. Now. Iris and Gidon showed you um, uh, a lot of um, spine disease and uh, arthropathy. Well, this is the same disease. This is dish in a uh, in a um, uh, in a baboon, and you can see the sacroiliac joints. These sacroiliac joints are narrowed. So we did a study looking at sacroiliitis in mammals. And we pulled every single mammal x-ray that we had at the zoo, and there were several hundreds. And then on every positive, the uh, vets went and they did an HLA-B27. It's species dependent. There were some species that have very, had very high levels of HLA-B27. But what we were surprised to find was the level of, of spine disease and disc disease. And the correlation is this, all animals that walk on two feet, even some of the time, like bears, have low back, have, uh, have disc disease specifically. So we found uh, vacuum vertebra and, uh, and uh, discogenic changes on uh, the entire spectrum of primates and in bears too. And this is another uh, baboon. And look at the extensive osteophytes. This was something that before I worked with the zoo, I thought that these types of back pain was specific to humans because I never heard an animal complaining. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these are silver leaf langers. They're very cute animals. And uh, when they're young, they're orange. And then when they grow older, their hair becomes somewhat darker and then turns white. Kind of like us. <laughs> Right. They're very curious uh, creatures, and some of them are just like us too. Right? I have residents who do just us, so it's been all okay. <coughs> now, the zoo have, they have several very, very rigid rules that were put in for you know, all kinds of protections that make sense. Any animal that has a lifespan of over 30 days that is brought to the zoo is quarantined for 30 days before the animal is put into the regular collection. And that is to identify any kinds of communicable diseases. The second is that any animal that's brought to the zoo gets a full medical battery test. They don't care where it came from. It could be transferred from the Berlin Zoo, from the San Diego Zoo. It doesn't matter. It comes to the zoo. It gets a full medical exam, including radiography, ultrasound, mammo, uh, etc. Now, the, the Bronx Zoo is the main uh, area that the uh, customs and fish and wildlife officials from all of the New York area airports and the international airports are JFK and Newark are the big ones and LaGuardia is from Mexico or uh, Canada and there is a very big business in smuggling of wildlife into the United States 
to sell for all kinds of things, for funny types of pets and uh, for uh, uh, um, uh, uh, interesting types of food. So this, um, this silver leaf langer was actually smuggled in. This was brought by uh, customs officials. So when they x-rayed her, she was, oh, she's pregnant. So it was interesting how the, uh, before they give birth, the fetus actually moves. Right? The head moves. Now, this is another Jalara pebble, uh, a silver leaf langer. Now, <clears throat> this silver leaf langer was also brought in. This was brought in by the New York Police Department because he it was found in an apartment in the Bronx or in Harlem. I don't remember where the apartment was. And as part of the radiographs, they found this stuff in his abdomen, what he'd been eating. So they analyzed the stool, and it's lead paint. So there's an issue with human children eating lead paint because the lead is sweet, and children like eating the paint. Turns out the animals like eating the paint too. So the treatment is the treatment for uh, removal of lead. Uh, chelating agents, etc. That's the same treatment uh, that's done over here. Now, these, these uh, the silver leaf langers, they have uh, wonderful appetites. And you read populist literature, like the New York Times, um, and you'll find um, knowledgeable uh, articles on animals always know how to eat what's good for them, except for humans. Well, that's not true. Animals love junk food. They're junk food crazy. If you give them junk food that they like, they will eat junk food and not eat anything but junk food. Now, it's interesting what animals consider junk food. So, um, chocolates and things like that, there are some animals that just love it. For uh, silver leaf langers, there are certain types of leaves that they can't digest, but it's junk food to them. They, as much as they can find that this leaf, they will eat. And this is what's inside the belly. Sometimes it looks like a bezoar. Those are all these funny leaves that they're finding that some of them are not digesting. Well, then we had some uh, uh, silver leaf langer that kept eating, and this guy was obstructed. And he was just uh, lying on a branch, and he, the, the keepers looked, and they said, he's got a problem. It's a huge swollen belly. So they anesthetized him. They burned him down. They took him in. The vets operated on him, and they, they found his intestines were just crammed with this leaf. So after him, there were two other silver leaf langers who came in with the same leaf bezoar. So the, um, the curator of uh, mammals got involved, and he said, this is outrageous. This, this, cannot, uh, this cannot continue. And uh, across the street from the Bronx Zoo is the New York Botanical Garden. Now, there are two different organizations but they work very closely together. He brought in the people from the New York Botanical Garden to go through the entire area of the primates and eradicate all leaves that uh, could trigger this type of entity. Everything from that species or similar species. They showed them the leaves that were pulled out of the uh, silver leaf langer bellies and then the, uh, the botanists went through and eradicated and they taught the zoo people what to do to treat this plant so it won't come back. And um, since that was done, there have been no more cases of silver leaf langur um, obstructions. Now, we have other problems with um, uh, langurs where they eat stuff and they get obstructed and you, you have to disimpact them and you don't know what's in. So sometimes I have to do a parimenema on a, uh, on a langur or on some other kind of a uh, primate. Things that I didn't think I'd be doing when I did my residency. <laughs> now, this is the role that I use the mammal machine. Um, metabolic bone disease. This is all rickets. Metabolic bone disease in, um, in two populations very serious. One, in primates. All primates in captivity, we have an issue with metabolic bone disease. The second group are reptiles and amphibians. Um, for reptiles, we examined a series of uh, close to 750 different reptile and amphibian individuals, animal x-rays. 
looking for evidence of metabolic bone disease, and we found metabolic bone disease in over 60% of them. And that raises a question. The zoo has on staff a full-time PhD nutritionist whose job it is to identify the nutritional requirements of that exact species compared to what it is that they eat in the wild, wherever the wild is. Central Zaire, in uh, Costa Rica, whatever it is, she's the one who's matching and making sure that what they're given exactly matches uh, the nutritional content of what they have outside. But we were finding on the zoo way too much metabolic bone disease it didn't fit. For a lot of the monkeys and the primates, it turned out that it was people throwing chocolates and candies and popcorn, and the animals were eating that instead of eating other stuff. Now, this, these look like phalanges, don't they? But they're not. This is the tailbone. The tail in animals looks like the phalange bones, but keeps growing. So this is one of the things that I did at the zoo. Initially, I saw, on we actually did whole body x-rays of these animals, and I looked at the tail, and I said, you know, this is what I'm going to use for assessment of, of rickets. Because tail bones grow throughout the animal's life. So I, it's as if I'm always looking at a pediatric bone. It's the easiest place for me to see metabolic bone disease. So it's funny because I'll take some big animal, like a lion, and who's asleep, and I'll take the tail, tip of the tail, and I'll put it on the mammal machine, and then I'll mammal the tail uh, to look for mammal. But that's why I, I put a mammal machine in the zoo. So it's for, for this use. Okay, so here's the, uh, you look at their cervical spines. You know, I showed you a, uh, a water's view and a frontal view of the cervical spine on these uh, gorillas. You wouldn't know that this was not a human. Okay, so the white-handed gibbon, another very adorable animal. You can see the pelvis is uh, very different. If Noga Shapshin was here, she'd be trying to convince me that this is mm -hmm. femoral acetabular impingement <laughs> pincer type. Right, okay. Um, and then she'd probably try to talk me in that this was an uh, ASD or something like that. But you look at the scapula, it's somewhat longer. And um, it was uh, uh, x-rays like this that actually got me started with uh, the, current, uh, the current issue that we have with the zoo. After I left the residency, I was, uh, I was at Columbia, and I'm reading an x-ray one day, I had this funny thing on the shoulder, an excrescence from the uh, distal clavicle to the uh, coracoid. And I had no idea what this thing was. So I told the resident, I said, I can't read this, I don't know what it is. I gotta go find out what it is. So I did a literature search, and I found a reference that sounded probable in the Singapore Journal of Medicine. Turns out Columbia had the Singapore Journal of Medicine. I pulled the article, I opened it up, sure enough, this is it. I look, oh, what's it called? The coracoclavicular joint. I read about it, and it references some article written in 1934 that says it's normal in gorillas and gibbons. Okay, this sounds interesting. So I go, and I, uh, of course, Columbia didn't have that 1934 reference. So I called the Bronx Zoo. And I got transferred and transferred, and finally somebody answered the phone. And he, it was the chief vet at the Bronx Zoo. And I, I asked him if he had x-rays of, uh, of gorillas and gibbons, and he says, yeah. I said, can I look at them? He says, why? I said, I want to see if you have, I give him the, the story, and I said, I want to see if you have, he says, you don't need to see, you know it's there because you have a reference. I said, no, I said, it hasn't been looked at in a long time. Uh, it needs to be really looked at. He said, why? I said, I think this is a very important and timely topic, and uh, it needs to be republished. Mm -hmm. He goes, who would publish this now? I said, are you kidding? We'd find anybody. We just can't publish it in a veterinary journal, but a human journal would love this. It's a human interest story. So he said, okay, come on down. And we reviewed 80, uh, 80 different uh, animals, and indeed that 1934 reference was correct that we found the most in gorillas and gibbons, not that much in uh, the other primates. And we wrote the article, and the zoo is very, very afraid of the animal rights activists. So mm -hmm. anything that's going to be published from the zoo has to be reviewed by a committee to approve what you're going to publish. So I send them the article, and then they call me up and they say, you can't publish the article. And I said, why not? 
And they said, well, your Titan's bad. And the, uh, I said, oh, well, what do you want? They said, well, you're calling it, uh, I said, you're calling this in humans and not.